Good evening and welcome to the Carnegie Town Hall. This meeting of the City Council will begin in a few moments. The City Council meets on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month at 7 p.m. and serves as the City's policymaking and legislative body. Each meeting is governed by Robert's Rule of Order unless those guidelines conflict with City Ordinance or Charter. City Council meetings offer an opportunity for citizens to speak directly to their elected representatives. Those in attendance are invited to address the Council during the public input segment at the beginning of the agenda. At that time, any issue that is not subject to formal action later in the agenda can be addressed. Testimony that concerns a resolution or an ordinance's second reading is only allowed when those specific agenda items are being addressed by the Council. When addressing the Council, citizens should speak directly into the microphones at the podium and state their names for the record after being recognized by the Chair. To accommodate and respect all viewpoints, citizen comments are limited by ordinance to no more than five minutes each. Comments should be respectful and focused on providing new information that will benefit the Council's deliberative process. By City Ordinance, all remarks must be addressed to the City Council as a body and not to any City Council member, including the Mayor. The Chair reserves the right to limit the number of speakers. City Council meetings are broadcast live on CityLink and online at SiouxFalls.org. Information regarding the City Council, its committees, meetings, briefings, and members is available by visiting SiouxFalls.org slash council or by calling the Council office at 605-367-8085. Thank you for your interest in Sioux Falls City Government. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's City Council meeting. We're certainly pleased to have you here. It is Tuesday, April 3rd, and we'll begin our meeting with uh, an introduction of your City Council. Council members Neitzert. Here. Rolfing. Here. Selberg. Here. Starr. Here. Staley. Here. Erickson. Here. Erpenbach. Here. Kylie. Here. Councilors, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Uh, leading our invocation today is Terry Nyberg of the Direct Line Prayer Center. And just to be, uh, to be brief, uh, let you folks know that right across the street from City Hall uh, is the Direct Line Prayer Center. And these are folks that uh, make it a point to pray, uh, not only for the mayor, this city council, this city, and so many others, uh, and they do that every day. Uh, so it's a real honor, real blessing, Terry, to have you here and, and certainly your whole team praying for us. Uh, what we'd ask is that you stand for Terry's um, uh, invocation, and please remain standing for our Pledge of Allegiance. Terry? <coughs> Good evening. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege and the freedom we have to come to you in prayer. We thank you that you are a living God, and we thank you that you hear us when we pray. I invite your holy presence to fill this room and to guide this meeting. For your word says in Isaiah 30, 21, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ear will, will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Thank you, Lord, for Mayor Huther and his years of service to Sioux Falls. Bless him and guide him in the next <coughs> chapter of his life. Lord, I bring this meeting to you, and I ask that you would fill each person here with the mind of Christ. We call down wisdom, understanding, and guidance, and say take your place in the discussions and decisions made here tonight. I pray for each council member and each person bringing forth issues to discuss. We ask for a spirit of unity, attentiveness, respect, and cooperation. I pray that the decisions and votes would be made that are in the best interest of our beautiful city and serve to raise the level of righteousness in our city. For we declare that Sioux Falls is a city of refuge. It is a city of hope. 
and it is a city on a hill that shines bright. And finally, Lord, I pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, here in each person, on earth, here in this meeting, on earth, here in Sioux Falls, yes, on earth, as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, just a hearty good evening to everybody. Welcome to uh, the City Council meeting. Certainly glad that we've got so many in attendance. Um, I do have a couple of proclamations that I'd like to start with. Uh, and if you don't mind, is Kristen Fox here? Kristen, please come forward. Thank you. And Kristen, do you have some others that want to join you? I do. Please, welcome. Just introduce yourself along with your guests, please. Thank you, Kristen. Hi, I'm Kristen Fox. I'm director of the Senior Compro companion program and this is Connie Peters one of our senior companions and she's also representative on our council and Deb Dockin is our chair of our council thank you. Mm -hmm. well thank you for being here appreciate it um, the proclamation reads whereas service to others is a hallmark of the American character and central to how we meet our challenges and the nation cities are increasingly turning to national service and volunteerism as cost-effective strategies to meet critical needs. Whereas AmeriCorps and Senior Corps participants address the most pressing challenges facing our communities, from educating students for the jobs of the 21st century, to fighting the opioid epidemic, to responding to natural, natural disasters, to supporting our veterans and military families. Whereas National Service expands economic opportunity by creating more sustainable, resilient communities and providing education, career skills, and leadership abilities for those who serve. Whereas, locally, senior companions offer assistance and friendship to older adults, helping them remain safe and healthy in their own homes, and RSVP stands ready to connect individuals with nonprofit organizations that address community needs, increasing the impact of the agencies that they serve. Whereas national service participants demonstrate commitment, dedication, and patriotism by making an intensive commitment to service, a commitment that remains with them in their future endeavors. Whereas the Corporation for National and Community Service shares a priority with local leaders nationwide to engage citizens, improve lives, and strengthen communities, and is joining with the National League of Cities, the National Association of Counties, cities of service, and local leaders across the country. Now, therefore, I, Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim April 3rd, 2018 as National Service Recognition Day in Sioux Falls and encourage residents to recognize the positive impact of national service in our city and thank those who serve and find ways to give back to their communities. Let's give them a rousing round of applause. Okay, very yeah, good. To to thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I do have a second proclamation. Valerie, um, where's Valerie? Thank you, Valerie. Okay. Are you alone, Valerie? I am. Love it. Love it. Well, I'm with you. I'm with you. Thank you. Valerie, just please uh, introduce yourself to the people of our town, please. Okay. Uh, Valerie with the Human Relations Office. We're the civil rights office that enforces anti-discrimination laws like the Fair Housing Act. The proclamation reads, 
whereas housing is a critical component of family community, and community health and stability. Whereas April 11, 2018 marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the Fair Housing Act, which set forth a policy that all individuals should have the opportunity for fair housing. Whereas fair, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, disability, and national origin. Whereas the city of Sioux Falls is committed to providing equal access for all in housing and enforcing fair housing laws. Whereas Fair Housing Month provides a reminder to community members of the importance of fair housing in Sioux Falls and all communities. Whereas only with cooperation, commitment, and support from all community members, that's everyone in Sioux Falls, can barriers to housing opportunities be removed. Now therefore, I'm Mike Huther, Mayor of the City of Sioux Falls, do hereby proclaim this month, April 2018, as Fair Housing Month in the City of Sioux Falls and encourage all community members to support fair housing in our community and to thank those community members, organizations, and businesses who have opened their doors for housing opportunities for the residents of Sioux Falls. This round of applause is for all of us Sioux Falls. Let's give it. I now have the pleasure to welcome uh, Councillor Greg Neitzert uh, uh, to, to the stage here. Councillor Neitzert, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's my pleasure to announce this month's Superhero Award winners. We have two deserving recipients this month. We're going to bring our winners up one at a time to be recognized, and then we're going to take a group picture with the mayor and myself. The Superhero Award recognizes citizens who make a positive impact in our community through their actions and contributions. Our first recipient is Dave Loki. Dave, could you please come forward? <laughs> Let's learn a little bit about Dave. Dave Loki has volunteered more than 750 hours since he began with Big Brothers Big Sisters of the Sioux Empire in 2015. He volunteers his time on evenings and weekends to assist with all IT needs of the agency and receives no compensation in return. Dave makes himself readily available for service and support. He is an expert in his field and Big Brothers Big Sisters benefits from his vast amount of knowledge and experience. The impact of Dave's donated time to Big Brothers Big Sisters saves the agency thousands of dollars per year. Dave Loki is an outstanding volunteer and is a genuine superhero. Congratulations, Dave. Our next recipient is Joel Cook. Would the family of Joel please come forward? This is a very special award. This is our first posthumous award. This man's service is what inspired Councillor Selberg to create the Superhero Award. We're honored to have his family here tonight. Joel Cook was a quiet man of great faith who was always working behind the scenes to help those with needs within Our Savior Lutheran Church and the community at large. Joel was very active in the church by serving on the church council, executive committee, as an usher, and working around the church on everyday projects a quiet saint and faithful servant, always at his post. He always had a quick smile and a gentle spirit. Outside of church, Joel touched many lives. His fellow colleagues at Jim Dunham and Associates shared that Joel was such a large part of their company that we named a plant after him. <laughs> Joel's mother gave us a beautiful plant from his memorial service, and it's a company-wide mission to take care of it. You'll often hear statements like, Joel looks good today, and Joel is really growing. <laughs> According to Councillor Marshall Selberg, Joel served as our leader, not just in title, but more importantly, by example. We have multiple services every Sunday, and Joel would be there every week, ready to fill in for each and every service. Whenever needed, always with a smile, and you would never hear him complain or say an ill word of anyone. Joel is a true example of what this award should be about. 
He was a person who selflessly served and gave of himself to others, not for awards, not for recognition, or for a motive of what was in it for him. He did it because he cared and because it was right. What an example for all of us. Let's give Joel and his family a round of applause. And finally, if you know it's someone who deserves to be recognized, please go to SiouxFalls.org slash MyHero to enter your nomination. Winners will be put on a plaque that we have right over there. It's easy to nominate someone, and we want to recognize those who are giving back to the community. Thank you very much, and we're just going to take a group photo. Thank you. Councillor Neitzert, Councillor Selberg, thank you both uh, for your vision. Appreciate it. Uh, that was wonderful. We'll now move to our consent agenda. Uh, Council, any uh, changes or motions? Discussion? Move to approve Erickson. Second, Rolfing. Councillor Vice Chair Erickson has made a motion to approve our consent agenda tonight. Second by Councillor Rolfing. If no discussion, a roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Thank you. That is passed eight to zero. Our regular agenda. Any changes to that, Council? Move to approve. Second, Selbert. And a motion to approve our regular agenda, seconded uh, as well. A roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Thank you, Council. That has also passed eight to zero. Folks, this is our public input portion of our, of our meeting. Uh, it really gives you an opportunity to engage the council on a topic that you deem important. Uh, we'd ask that you just um, come forward, uh, introduce yourself to the people of our town, just state your name, please. Uh, the council has asked that you keep your comments to five minutes or less. Please address the body as a whole uh, versus someone individually up here. Uh, and then last, if there's a topic that, you're, that you want to talk about and it's later on on the agenda, uh, the council would respectfully ask that you wait until that time uh, to to address it. So, folks, anybody want to engage the council? Welcome. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Thor Barden, and uh, I've lived here in Sioux Falls since we tried to take down the Zip Feed Tower, and uh, eventually got her down. Uh, you know, I wanted to come in and talk about a wonderful experience that I had. Uh, not too often we hear about something that's uh, super awesome and exciting up at these meetings. Uh, last week, I had a uh, illness, uh, strep throat actually, first time I'd ever had it, and I decided to go to the Falls Community Health. And uh, while I was there, uh, you know, I, well, first I started out the day, I called them first thing in the morning, and I said, hey, I really need an appointment, and they got me in on the same day. Then I arrived, and they were very understanding that it was quite difficult to speak because my throat was so, was so sore, and... Uh, they, they kept it the yes, no questions. They were very courteous, uh, offered me a face mask. That way I wouldn't get other people sick as well. I graciously took that. And then throughout the whole experience, I actually worked directly with a uh, registered nurse uh, who handled the majority of my visit there. She asked me the questions. She was very courteous. She was very kind. She asked me what did I need. You know, as opposed to a lot of times where we've heard we go into a doctor and they say, oh, here's what you need. You're good to go. See you later. Bye. You know, and uh, I, I just, I felt that it was worth coming in and expressing the, uh, you know, thankfulness that we have this program in Sioux Falls, that we have this facility that's available with such kind and generous and polite individuals uh, that really set an example for the healthcare industry, in my opinion. On a separate note, uh, as a candidate uh, for Sioux Falls election, uh, I just want to say thank you very much to those that have worked with me, uh, that have talked to me, and uh, let me know the process on this. 
Um, and that's or my, my apologies, sure. I've been given direction. During uh, the campaign, when you're this close to it, mm -hmm. we, uh, we apologize. Oh. Uh, we are not allowed to sure. provide uh, just, that opportunity. Okay, I apologize. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you, Thor, so, yep. and uh, glad you're feeling better. Yeah, thank you. Great job. Thank you. Folks, anybody else, welcome. I'm Catherine Riffle. Glad to see you again. I just want to impress upon you that not all your decisions in your terms have been good decisions. I would ask you to search your souls, your minds, your hearts, your spirits to make better decisions. If you leave your seat or not, if you're staying for the county, the community, whatever. Um, I ask that you really take another look at our community within the community. Um, I have to add as a personal note, I'm so glad my daughter did not die on our streets. She died in a farmhouse without water. But for those that have died on our streets, it has touched my heart. And I hope you will all search yours and find a way to open up a shelter without complications added to it and address the needs of the people. There's mental illness, there's alcohol, there's AIDS, HIV, brokenheartedness, et cetera, et cetera. I can go on. I'd rather not. I thank you for helping the people that you have helped when I've came to your meetings before. Some things have been changed. It has helped. Uh, we still have lost some lives, but at least it's... Um, not a larger number. I'm sorry to say of all the ones that have passed within the past few years, could have been spared. And I'm going to be retiring from street work coming up. Hopefully within our town, you will pick up the slack and meet the needs of the people. The community out there is not what we assume it is or what we figure they are. I've seen us around here snicker at them, make fun of them, laugh at them. But they're just like us. They care, they have feelings, they look after each other. And uh, to block them at hotels and stuff and put them on a time basis is not helping. I thought I'd add that in. Y'all have a good one. Thank you for listening to me. I'll be back. I'm going to start addressing our county meetings and see what we can do there too. Thank you again for helping everybody. Best you can for a while. <laughs> Catherine, thank you. Folks, anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome. Please go ahead. Hello, my name is Janet Brecky, and I've just got two issues I'd like to discuss with you very briefly. I'm going to attempt to summarize a complicated issue in a short time. Um, the first one is executive order, this executive order that I placed up before you. Um, this was implemented by uh, Mayor Huther in 2016, and I believe that this is a very, very broad um, confidentiality order, which I think may be creating that culture of secrecy that um, everyone is so concerned about in City Hall. And I think that it's, it's very broad, and it's the, the problem with it is that it's written for a business, because it actually has the phrase business necessity in it. And it's appropriate for a business, because business has lots of secrets. I mean, if you work for Apple Computer, they've got a lot of secrets, so it's OK to have a really tight um, confidentiality order. But to apply this to, to um, city government is creating a culture of secrecy, and I think that and. Uh, it has a chilling effect on city employees. It puts them in fear of dispersing public information. So I would strongly recommend that um, the council and the mayor take a look at that. And I hope that a new mayor would consider taking a look at that and consider resending it. Because it seems that a lot of the city council's problems has occurred um, since 2016 when this was probably implemented. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about, again, just very briefly, is the complicated issue. And I hope you'll bear with me as I try to oversimplify it with an analogy. I want you to look at this box and think of this box as the city clerk's office. And it used to be, it was easy to find records. This record was very difficult to find. It was easy because you could just go to the city clerk's office and all of the city records were there. When you went to the city clerk's office 
and you opened the box, you found all of the council's official signed records in history, and you found all of the administration's signed records in history. You found all of the um, legislative you know, history, and you found what came out of the administration. When I went to do some research on the structure of government, because I'm concerned about this, this issue, you know, this issue of transparency, I found two things. One was half of the records were missing. All of the city council records are there, but all of the mayor and administrative records are all over the city in various departments. So it makes it very hard to find them. So very simply put, what I'm simply suggesting, and I hope that the, the council will consider doing this, and I have you know, detailed information on how they could accomplish this, is to simply change back to the way it was. Make your, city, make your city clerk's office, once again, the holder of all of the records. So when you come in, it's a one-stop shop. You can find everything there. Now put all of the city records back in one box so they're easy to find with all the history and they're right at your fingertips. And I think that will go a long way to help you with your transparency issue. Thank you. Folks, did anybody else want to engage the council? Welcome. Bruce, you must have something really good too. Of course I do, it's Bruce Danielson, and I guess I'm here to entertain you too. Uh, so that team, they, they toured Falls Park, reviewed the hazards, the procedures, and those past incidents, and uh, the report that they, they brought back to the city didn't include any, any additional recommendations in, in terms of the river hazards, so. To let you know I'm not a full-time senator complainer. 30 years ago, I traveled the United States developing disaster recovery programs and systems for major corporations and governments. I ask many questions from this spot because I see issues stemming from secrecy and lack of transparency coming from poor planning processes. Some of the projects I developed solutions for allowed major banking institutions to survive and operate during the 1989 and 94 California earthquakes and more. I sent all of you a press release last week asking three basic questions. Is Sioux Falls ready to handle a major catastrophic event? <coughs> have we done preparedness drills? Do we have a mutual aid agreement in place with surrounding communities for fire, police, and ambulance services? So far, our review says we don't have a yes to any of these questions. It's time for the citizens to ask the town to make major leadership changes in this election before it's too late. Last Monday, as I left downtown, I stopped to assess the train derailment under the 11th Street Viaduct. What I saw shocked, and it should cause everyone in Sioux Falls to consider the ramifications and lack of benefit we get from our mayor's $27 million railroad relocation program. The events this week should shock and scare us to the point of action. The train derailment missed becoming a mass casualty incident by razor thin margin. Fortunately, these rail cars contain grain. However, other hazardous substances able to quickly gas or burn are regularly transported on the same route through our downtown. The derailment of a car containing more hazardous substances like ammonia fertilizer could destroy or paralyze several square miles of Sioux Falls very quickly. Potentially thousands of people would have to be evacuated if they had not been killed. I took the accompanying photos during the early and post derailment process. Photos show four rail cars on their sides with grain spilling out. Workers were already cleaning up the grain. The photos also show how the rail car slid within a foot or so of taking out a pillar holding the bridge up. It is very likely the viaduct could have collapsed. The four fully loaded rail cars weighed about a million pounds. That's one million pounds of kinetic energy pushing into the ground, possibly moving the pillar's foundation. What would happen not if, but when several million pounds of rail cars land differently next time? As it is, have the footings been inspected by a reputable state highway inspector? Once the pillar support can be inspected, the viaduct may yet be closed. Get the answer to this question. Did the sliding rail cars disturb the bridge foundation? At several city meetings, we asked to see city disaster recovery plans 
ready to be put into action. My requests for disaster plans seem to be reasonable given how many full-time disaster recovery planners are paid high city salaries. Regardless, in answer to my request for the plans, only blank stares or claims of computer simulation games are given. Now we're back to when will Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County get real mutual aid ambulance agreements. We never receive a straight answer from this administration. Will we get one from the next? Secret agreements, deals, and no transparency is all we find when we dig into the Sioux Falls City government. The released SDPAA training exercise project being portrayed by our administration as a real report shows how little our current government cares about the real health and safety of the public. We got very, very lucky this time. What will happen when the next derailment or a tornado happens? No doubt the people who were paid to plan for these events will blame it on the, everyone else and claim it was the fault of the administration who happens to be in office at the time of the disaster. Why is it always an act of God? Where is this discussion in the current campaign? Why does someone have to die for action to happen? You know, that uh, I, I don't think it's a secret that people know I'd love to be your mayor forever. We don't come up here to entertain you. We come up here to inform you. What kind of morons run this outfit? Thank you. We'll be talking about it some more. Thank you, Mr. Danielson. Appreciate it. Welcome. Scott Harrisman, Sioux Falls. <clears throat> Speaking of the trains, last week I was sitting in my house and I can always hear the whistle blow in my, in my house. The whistle started blowing at <clears throat> eight o'clock at night. It kept blowing and blowing and blowing. I went to bed at 10, they still were blowing. I sleep in the basement because of the trains. They're loud. Well, the whistles were so loud, they woke me up at midnight, in which they were still blowing four hours later. Went back to bed. They woke me up again at 3 in the morning. The whistles were still blowing. From 8 p.m. till 3 a.m., they were still blowing. I went back to bed. I don't know how much longer they went. Besides the, the safety issue that Bruce brought up, the noise from the trains is getting bad. And for people to worry about someone playing a bass or drums in a music club and, and noise, the trains are the worst, noisiest thing we have downtown. The railroad redevelopment project was poorly negotiated. We should have had an open, open negotiation with them, with the council and the public and open houses for the public to come and put their input in on this $27 million. Because I guarantee you, the public would have asked to reduce the train traffic downtown. I guarantee it. It's worse than it was before the deal. 8 p.m. to 3 a.m., horns constantly blaring that long. Doesn't make any sense. That's the thing that Janet talked about. Just a reminder. Government is not business, and business is not government. You cannot apply business private business things to government. Why? Because private business is owned by private people. Government is owned by us, and it must be open. This confidentiality thing is a joke. You're basically telling city employees that they cannot disperse public information to the public, or they will be fired. That is something corporations do to protect their business. We shouldn't have done that. One more thing. Recently, a city council was on Inside Town Hall, and they said the reason why the administration buildings costing us $25 million is because when the city builds buildings, they cost more because we build 100-year buildings. I started laughing. I'm trying to figure out what 100 bu year buildings we have built. The only one I can think of actually is probably the arena. I think it's a fortress. I you always talk, everyone says they want to tear it down. Good luck. So let's talk about the baseball stadium. I believe that was built in the 60s or 70s. It's crumbling, even though we put tons of money into it trying to fix it. Midco Aquatic Center. 
As I understand it, it had to be closed and the pool had to be drained because it had a leak in it right after we built it. That's not a 100 year building. Convention center, tons of repairs we've had to do to that building. That's only been around for about 20 years. The pavilion, that was supposed to be a $19 million building. We have poured about $50 million in that thing and we're still not done fixing it. The, the roof leaked from day one. That's not a 100 year building. The event center, oh boy, the event center. We have siding popping off the thing. We have to check it every three years in case it doesn't fall off in the rick. That's not a 100 year building. So now all of a sudden we get to the administration building and it's gonna be a 100 year building. Where's our record? We don't have a record of building 100 year buildings. We have a record of building about 10 year buildings. That building shouldn't have cost us $25 million. Because I guarantee it probably won't be a 100 year building. Unless this contractor is doing something different than all the contractors before us. The building wasn't needed anyway. We all know that. The building was decided to be built by one person, and that's it. The public had no input. The council had no input. Nobody had any input. Only one person. We built a $25 million building with a million dollar mortgage payment a year to save $100,000 in a lease payment. Makes sense. Sierra Bruce Sarge Sioux Falls. So this weekend, um, we rounded up seven people and got them arrested on the Central District side um, for lottering and disorderlies. One pimp on the east side of town that the police said that they couldn't catch worked with Omaha, Nebraska PD, set up the arrangement, got him over there. He got arrested for pimping and pandering, $17,000 bond, and his female prostitute on $6,000 bond. So here I am, got all the policemen on one side of the town, and I'm not going to say who, and we talked about politics because I made them talk about it. And they said, with all the crime going on and all the drugs coming in and out of here and the police's hands are tied. And businesses are calling me to come and call the police because police come and they don't make an arrest. So it happened because I told them that we have to make an arrest here. So we're sitting on the street corner and I'm asking the sergeants and the lieutenants and the officers what is the problem with the crime on the streets? And they said, upper management. So what is upper management? So, so what's going on here? Because I told them, the next uh, mayor, I don't care who it is, we're going to do that petition drive, and, and the chief's gone. The chief of policemen they mentioned, assistant chief Galen, and some captains. It's tying the officers as hands. They didn't say nothing about City Hall or the mayor. Do I believe that somebody's tying their hands? Of course. I've done told y'all about these pimps and these drugs. I had to take this pimp on in, in Pat Storch's district and have him go to another state to get him busted. He's been living on that side for 11 months. Pretty sad. So the next mayor, it's not going to take out the chief of police. I already know it. If it's Jameson's going to win or Jim Enzeman's going to win, nobody's going to take out the mayor. We're going to have to drive the chief of police out of here, and we're going to have to do a petition drive where the citizens vote for their own chief of police here. When you have policemen telling me, and I don't care who believes it or not, but you got policemen on the streets telling me it's upper management, we got a problem. That's why City Hall should have cleaned up that police department. The crime is happening because some, and I told the policemen, I know that, that they're participating in the crime here, but it's, it's to catch them all to get it. So the next mayor has to clean it up. And I know the mayor's laughing, okay? Let him laugh. Because I'm sitting here by Mercado's right across the street and drug dealing and drug trafficking's happening and nothing's getting done about it. I'm sitting in these pimps as houses and nothing's getting done about it. It's because of upper management. It's tying law enforcement's hands. And I wish that law enforcement can get involved and come to public input because we would have a packed house on this issue. So 
So I really don't think it's funny. I, I, re I really don't. I just had to go testify today in court on, on a guy that I got arrested. So we're going to be repeatedly pick up these people, and I'm going to have to stand here and write statements and testify in court if I have to. But these police officers should be able to do their job and not have their hand tied by upper management. So the mayor, uh, this mayor or the next mayor, should, ha should clean house. It, it, it's as simple as cleaning house. People can get rid of the chief of police. People can clean up 20 and 30 years that people's been there. But let me tell you something here, and I told y'all, when this election's going to come up, I'm releasing the names of these officers that are in corruption, and we have two of them on a, on a police department for us, and we have some Minnehaha County police paying for prostitutes. And I'm going to mention those names, and I'm going to put it on Facebook before April the 10th. People of Sioux Falls, uh, what you have to realize uh, is that... Um, we have made a decision as a uh, city council. A point of order, Mr. Mayor. Uh, point, to point allow. Of, no, I, we are to, not uh, allowed to just make a comment during this time. And in my. I, I would my, like to vote. I make a motion that we vote on allowing the mayor to speak because the rest of us are not allowed to make comments. And we are all equal in this body right now. No, no editorializing by any of us. So I, I make a motion that we vote on allowing the mayor to speak. That has died for a second. Thank you, Council Chair. I'll be very brief. Keep brief. Keep be very brief, brief. Please. Folks, as it falls, you have to realize, as a body, the uh, the City Council you is. You have no idea. Go, Teresa, stand up. If we could, we please have decorum in the audience, please. Okay. I would move for a recess. Second. Aye. Second, aye. Thank you. I will return on Tuesday. It's, it's not She's leaving. Day. She's leaving. She's leaving. She's leaving. Thank you. I'd Fuck ask. Teresa, you stand up for the people. Fuck the mayor. She's not, she's not back in here. I'll be back next Tuesday. If you want to know, trust We get all that? Good. Is there anybody else who wanted to speak uh, public input? Steven Siano, I come before you again. Uh, it is with, as I've said before, a good, good bit of difficulty with various physical ailments as well as the PTSD and logical and rule subtype Asperger's, which arguably actually makes me uh, quite capable in certain areas. Um, I look at this public-private thing that I just heard being discussed and it's something I've addressed in the past. Privacy, private, only pertains to we the people. Public, consent to the governed, has to be informed. If the people are not informed, you people have no right to do anything. It needs to be upon informing the public. I've got my problems. I'm trying to get it addressed. It goes back to uh, when I was a child and I was taught what my religion was about. <clears throat> I was told, don't sin, don't do bad things. And then I was told, when you do bad things, go and tell someone else about it. Called confession. It didn't make sense to me, because I got a scientific mind. It's like, wait a minute, these two don't go together. So I quit religion. And I quit rituals that went along with religion. So when you see me not taking part in certain rituals, 
It's not a matter of protest. It is my belief system. So let that be known, unlike what has made the media you know, big time distraction. Certain things I've made reference to, smoke and mirrors, bread and circuses. Does the public know what that means? Yeah, you, uh, you come up here and you got your shows that you put on to distract us from what is really significant. You as a legislative body, you in authority, need to provide some oversight, as I've said, and others here have said. There's a lot of people in this city that don't come here because it's inconvenient or they are threatened. They're afraid to. I, with my life threatened, have no choice. I've been trying, and I continue to try, to get payment for my needs and acknowledgement of my actual proven, confirmed disability through the VA and anywhere else, get my medical care. Yeah, like someone else said, Falls Community Health, they got a good system. They can get money from the VA if the city attorneys were to uh, work with them to get it because it is my right as a blacklisted, targeted, disabled veteran. And we don't need any uh, cemeteries using public land. I don't see if that's right. Um, and I do want maybe some people as candidates should uh, put it out there that they should uh, be held accountable if they do not serve the public, if it can be shown that any of their actions are for private reasons and it's not full disclosure. So we need a change in this city. We need a change in this country. I mentioned last time Jules Henry, Culture Against Man, 1963, anthropolo anthropological perspective on institutions such as our educational system, religion, many other institutions guide our mindset to our own destruction. Thank you. Colleen Sorensen, and I will have to ask, first of all, if this is the time that I'm supposed to comment on unfinished business, or do I wait until that point? Oh, wait, it's Colleen. We'll, we'll let you know. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, anybody else? Tim Stenger. I guess I could sort of understand why she gets a little excited, because every, every single phone number that she calls or everybody she tries to contact has her number blocked. So she's doing all this by herself. She's going out on the street, doing the city's job, and I gotta commend her for that because nobody else is gonna do it for her. But I will say one thing, someday she might end up laying on the street or found in some back alley where she might not be living. Then what are we gonna say? We gonna laugh at her? Because it's wrong. She's trying to make a difference in this town. She needs help. So maybe the city attorney's office, maybe the mayor, or maybe the police department should be able to sit down with her and try to get some information on what she knows, because obviously she knows a lot more than the city does. Two, we have an election coming up on the 10th. One of the biggest elections in Sioux Falls. I, I really do believe that. We either stay the course, spend, 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 or we make a difference. We get people in the office that are going to be here for the citizens of Sioux Falls. It was stated at one that uh, somebody said, I have a vision. I went outside, out, to, out in the town, and I asked people, different people, what is your vision? I asked elderly people, and they said, you know, my vision is to be able to retire. They're 75, 80 years old. 
Still working. But they have a vision that they want to retire someday. Is that ever going to happen? I really doubt it because they have to pay taxes. They have bills. Every time they turn around, they're going up. I ask people that have two jobs or three jobs, what is your vision? To be able to have one full-time job and not have to work weekends. That's a true vision. You talk to homeless people. They have a vision to be able to have a roof over their head and to be able to have food for their children. That's a true vision. But see, right now, our vision is spend, spend, spend. Who cares about the public? I want a mayor that isn't afraid to get in his car and drive every street in this town, not have to hire a company to come in and tell us that our roads are average. The mayor could have drove on every single street in this town and came out and said, boy, we got some problems because these roads are terrible. I wish I had a video camera on how we were filling potholes the other day. There was water in the potholes. We took a shovel, stuck it in there, and drove away. Everybody else has to drive over the top of it to, spend, to be able to try to get it to hold. But yet two days later, there's still a pothole. We have a big decision in this town. Again, people, you got to get out on the 10th, and you've got to really vote your heart on whether we're going to stay the course on what's going on in this town, or we get people in here that are willing to listen to the public and to be able to stand, understand what's going on in this town and listen to your heart. Greetings. I'm David Zokaitis, and I was sleeping ever so nicely this morning, and I got kicked out of bed and had to write this to have any peace for the day. I'm commenting on our political process, both nationally and locally. And it seems as though politicians have a, a special job, Can't, the candidates in general. What we do, what we do, is we go around and figure out what people want, and then if we're good at what we're doing, well, we try to deliver it. Um, hopefully it works out, sometimes not so well. But we also, a lot of us have to go and, and get campaign support in terms of money, and we need to listen to those, unfortunately, more than we might like. During this campaign and most campaigns, it seems as though crime is a real big issue. So always on the rise, no matter if it's going up or going down, it's on the rise. And, and then people talk about getting tough on crime and empowering police, but what does that really mean? Sometimes people really don't say. Do we get more cops and more jails and longer sentences? And then who pays for it? All these details really need to be filled in, but unfortunately for most candidates, they are not. And here's something that we should all know, but somehow most of us really don't. The USA is number one in prisons. Globally, we've got the largest prison population. And in terms of prisoners per capita, it's number one or number two. And during the, the candidate for mayor, all these forums, nobody even talked about that. It's like, nobody knows. And I'm going, well, what the heck, why not? Apparently, the media kind of ignores the statistic also. And if you look at the logic behind our um, drug and alcohol problems, well, there's some hidden protections there for favored industries. And that has a lot to do with why we are number one in prisons. But we should all talk about this. How's it going to get any better if nobody ever talks about it? Didn't happen during this campaign. And I'm thinking, well, what the heck? Something's going on here. Well, here's another issue that comes up in this campaign and in other campaigns. People talk about economic incentives for builders and developers. Uh, it seems as though candidates for mayor all favor TIFs. Well, those are just subsidies. They're subsidies that um, go out from regressive taxation to people with a whole lot of money. And somehow that doesn't come up in 
all these discussions. Now, I noticed that the local media during the forum last night, they had a couple of interesting questions that lead me to suppose that they support developers and construction. And there's a little bit of the questions that they asked. Oh, and the parking ramp that's going up, the, the $21 million ramp that, that should have cost $7 million or something like that. Apparently that's okay because none of the candidates for mayor want to cancel it. They all think it's a good idea. Or at least they don't want to cancel it. Again, we're not supposed to know that uh, these things are subsidies. We're just, nobody mentions that. What the heck? All right, now, but I did notice that there's, uh, on a couple of points, we're making progress as a city and electorate. All the candidates advocate drug treatment programs. Well, hey, that's good to hear. And we talk about transparency. Well, maybe they've listened to me a time or two because I've been talking about this for a while. Oh, and, you know, it'd be really nice if we could get some candidates out there, some politicians who were leaders trying to figure out what do we need to do better instead of just following the, the common herd and the status quo. We need some teachers who are willing to go out of their way to educate and awaken the world. So maybe I'll get a chance to do that sooner or later. Come here long enough, people will listen. Oh, and as always, we really need to enjoy nature. I was out with my kids last week to Terry Peak, and we had a grand time. So try to smile and enjoy life and not worry too much about all the people that give you too many suggestions. And with that, I bid us all a good evening. Folks, is there anybody else who want to engage the council? Welcome. Audrey Christensen, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Audrey. I was here about a year ago after the. Thank you. I was here about a year ago after the state wrestling meet, and because of the parking, it was horrible. I realize they probably should have built it north of town, but it was built inside the city limits. Okay. In February, I went out to the uh, Garth Brooks show was very good, volume-wise. The next show I went to, it was so loud, even with my hearing aids out, I had to leave. I called down to the city hall, oh, excuse me, and I left a message that they better do something about it because I was told that each concert has their own volume. Well, I'm sorry to say, I have tickets for Brad Paisley already. And if it isn't better, I will not go out to another concert at that, whatever you want to call it. The next thing I want to talk about is, train of thought. Last summer, the lights, one light pole was out at 8th and Chicago for a month. I called down to City Hall, the light department, three times. And finally, I called Teresa, and she said, you call again tomorrow, and I hope you get results. Well, you know what? I guess it took three Norwegians and one German to get that light bulb in. <laughs> because by 8 o'clock the next night, we had lights at 8th and Chicago. And now that's terrible, that you have to make three calls or more to get a light bulb replaced. And yet we're supposed to notify the city when there's a pothole, a light bulb, or whatever. Let's get with the program and what about these placemen or whoever's going down the street or city workers? Can't they call in and say, hey, there's a pothole here or there? No, they think they're too busy. But let's get with the program and advance this thing and we will get rid of all these potholes. You don't know how many times people have had to go to a repair shop and get their front end aligned because of all the potholes in Sioux Falls and it is bad, 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 bad. And I've called many, many times in because my neighbor lady and I, we walk quite a bit and we are the city patrol for the east side of Sioux Falls in a certain area. Whether it's, uh, well anyway, weeds that grow four feet tall and their whole backyard is full, bingo, we got results by notifying them so we didn't get them cockleburs or whatever in our yard. So I thank you for your time and I appreciate all you've done for us, and I really, really thank Teresa for all the help she's given me. I know I'm not supposed to mention names, but if I want action, like a year ago this past winter, I called Greg, I called Teresa, and I called Pat Starr, because 7th and Chicago, they got gravel down their street, and Chicago North, 
for free blocks, we didn't get nothing. It was like an ice skating pond. And like Greg, or like Pat Starr told me, hey, I've got a hill, and I had to call two to get gravel on my yard, because he had to walk it up four or five blocks in order to get home. So let's be equal on this maintenance of these streets, whether it's sand, gravel, snow removal, let's have equal opportunity. Thank you. You're welcome. Folks, anybody else? Very good. Item 33. Item 33 is a new 2017-18 retail malt beverage license for West Mall Theaters Incorporated, West Mall 7, 2101 West 41st Street, number 33, CUP not required. 34 is a new 2018 retail wine license for West Mall Theaters Incorporated, West Mall 7, 2101 West 41st Street, number 33, CUP not required. Item 35 is a new 2018 retail wine license for Corner Pub and Casino Incorporated, Corner Pub and Casino 2408 East 6th Street, CUP not required. This is in addition to an existing license which predates the ordinance. Item 36 is transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from Library Holdings Incorporated Library Bar 5108 South Marion Road to MG Oil Company Library Bar 5108 South Marion Road. Item 37 is transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from SD Billy Frogs Incorporated. Billy Frogs Bar and Grill, 5002 South Marion Road, to MG Oil Company, Billy Frogs, 5002 South Marion Road. Item 38 is a transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from Red Eye Holdings Incorporated, Red Eye Bar, 5013 North Cliff Avenue, to MG Oil Company, Red Eye Bar, 5013 North Cliff Avenue. Item 39 is a transfer of 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from Taylor Ventures Incorporated, Bubba J's 114 North Indiana Avenue to MG Oil Company, Bubba J's 114 North Indiana Avenue. Item 40 is transfer of 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from our Ventures Incorporated, the 18th Amendment, 1301 West 41st Street to MG Oil Company, the 18th Amendment, 1301 West 41st Street. Item 41 is a transfer of 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from Pinball Incorporated Jokers 5, 2220 South Minnesota Avenue, Suite 100, to MG Oil Company Jokers 5, 2220 South Minnesota Avenue, Suite 100. Item 42 is a transfer of 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from Pinball Incorporated, Joker 6, to 2220 South Minnesota Avenue, Suite 102, to MG Oil Company, Joker 6, 2220 South Minnesota Avenue, Suite 102. Item 43 is a transfer of a 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated, Jokers 2, Casino 2401 West 12th Street, to MG Oil Company, Jokers 2, Casino 2401 West 12th Street. Item 44 is a transfer of 2018 retail wine license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated Jokers to Casino 2401 West 12th Street to MG Oil Company Jokers to Casino 2401 West 12th Street. Item 45 is a transfer of 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated Jokers 3, 5005 West 12th Street to MG Oil Company Jokers 3, 5005 West 12th Street. Item 46 is a transfer of 2018 retail wine license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated Jokers 3, 5005 West 12th Street to MG Oil Company Jokers 3, 5005 West 12th Street. 47 is a transfer of 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated Jokers 4, 2218 South Minnesota Avenue to MG Oil Company Jokers 4, 2218 South Minnesota Avenue. Item 48 is a transfer of 2018 retail wine license, including video lottery terminals from TJT Incorporated Jokers 4, 2218 South Minnesota Avenue to MG Oil Company Jokers 4, 2218 South Minnesota Avenue. Item 49 is transfer of 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from Stanton Incorporated, Chubby's 2309 West Madison Street to Osmana Havelich. Amina Sports Coffee Bar, 2309 West Madison Street with conditional use permit, 8110-2018 being approved on March 7, 2018. 
Item 50 is transfer of 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales and video lottery terminals from CPAG LLC The Rush 2701 West 41st Street to CPAG LLC The Rush 2701 West 41st Street to include the fenced outdoor patio area located on the east side of the building. Item 51 is a transfer of a 2017-18 retail malt beverage license, including video lottery terminals from Neon Corporation, Neon Diner and Casino, 4101 East 10th Street to Neon Properties, Neon Casino, 4101 East 10th Street. Item 52 is a transfer of 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales from Baraco Limited Partnership, Baraco 5001 Southwestern Avenue to Vanguard Hospitality, Turks and Casio's Cabina Grill, 5001 Southwestern Avenue, pending final inspections per health. Item 53 is a transfer of 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales from Elmwood Hospitality, Crooked Pint Ale House, 2020 West Russell Street to Elmwood Hospitality, Crooked Pint Ale House, Holiday Inn Hotel and Suites, 2020-2040 West Russell Street, CUP not required. Item 54 is a transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales from Porter Apple Company, Incorporated, Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, 3221 East 10th Street to Applebee SF2 LLC Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, 3221 East 10th Street, with an effective date of April 16, 2018. Item 55 is a transfer of a 2018 retail liquor license, including Sunday sales from Porter Apple Company Incorporated, Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, 4000 West 41st Street, Suite 932 to Applebee's SS SXF. LLC, Apple, Applebee's Neighborhood Grill and Bar, 4001 West 41st Street, Suite 932, with an effective date of April 16, 2018. Item 56 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Augustana University, 2001 South Summit Avenue, for a special event on April 13, 2018. Item 57 is a special one-day malt beverage and special one-day wine licenses for Westford Hole Country Club, Incorporated, the Country Club of Sioux Falls to be operated at Sioux Falls Ford, 4901 West 26th Street for a social event on April 18, 2018. Item 58, special one-day well, well, one malt beverage license for Falls Area Single Track to be operated at the Great Outdoor Store, 2001 East 10th Street for a fundraiser on April 21, 2018. And item 59 is a special one-day liquor license request for TNT Entertainment Wiley's Tavern to be operated at 337 North Phillips Avenue, Albert House parking lot for an outdoor concert on July 13, 2018. Good evening, Jamie. Good evening, Jamie Palmer with licensing. Item 33 and 34 are new license requests for this applicant. Um, there was a security management plan that was submitted um, and approved by the police department and it's been ma made available on the electronic agenda. The applicant is present and if you have questions for him. Item 35 is a request for a new wine license. This applicant um, currently holds a malt beverage license and just would like to be able to um, offer wine to their customers. The majority of items 36 through 55 are transfers due to change of ownership, with the exception of item 50, which is simply a transfer to expand their license premise, as well as 53 to expand their license premise. All of the other transfers are due to a change of ownership. Items um, 56 through 59 are all special one days that have met the state law requirements, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Jamie, thank you, folks. I understand there are some people who would like to talk to a couple of these items. Uh, please come forward. Okay, again, my name is Colleen Sorensen, and thank you for allowing me the chance to come talk. First of all, I want to say thank you for the prompt attention to my email um, this morning that I sent. Within a couple hours, I got phone calls from three people and emails from two, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'm a mom of three teens, 14, 16, and 17, and I don't know how many of you have teens, but the culture of drinking in this city is rampant. It's awful. Kids drink all the time, everywhere, anytime they can get their hand on it. And up until this point, I felt pretty confident that they could go to a movie and not be exposed to it. And um, there's very few places in this city where teens can go where there is not alcohol served. Concerts, dinner, um, any restaurant almost, concerts, uh, ball games, any place they go, um, it's there. 
Um, so I have some concerns about how this will be monitored. Um, I know that a plan was submitted, but I just have some questions about that, um, if they can be answered today. Um, first of all, I would like to know how many will be sold per person. So for example, 22-year-old goes in, gets a wristband, shows their ID. Will they be allowed to purchase one per movie, one every time they come out? Um, how, is, how is that going to be monitored? Um, the reason I ask is I need to make sure that a 22-year-old is not going to go out and buy one with their wristband, take it into movie theater, give it to their 19-year-old girlfriend, go back out, purchase another one, take it back in, give it to their 20-year-old friend, go back out, purchase another one, take it back in, give it to another 17-year-old sitting beside them. How is that? How are we going to make sure that minors are not just going to have free access to this alcohol from people who are buying it for them who have a wristband? Um, I'm pretty sure West Mall 7 employees are not going to walk up and down the aisles in the movie theater making sure that everybody who's drinking it has a wristband. Um, what's to stop a you know, person of age from taking it back in, pouring it into the drink container of a minor? You're no, you'll never know if they're drinking it or not. Um, second question is, how will it be addressed for those so if, if, for example, one is being served per wristband, this, this, my next point might not be an issue, but if they're allowed an unlimited number of drinks, um, they will get obnoxious. They will get loud. Chances are it will happen. Um, if you're in a concert, a game, a restaurant, you don't notice people who are getting louder because it's already loud. But in a movie theater, you want it quiet. You want to, you want to hear what's going on. How is that going to be addressed? Will they be asked to leave? Will they lose their wrist brand privileges? I don't know how that will be taken care of. Um, so that, that was my second question. Um, and thirdly, I just implore you to keep a place where kids can go, where parents can know they're safe, and where they're not going to be exposed to things. Um, and I know the owner is here and probably has a different outlook on it than I do, and that's fine. But if he can answer some of these questions satisfactorily, I might change my input on it or my, my idea on it. But it would be, he would have to do a lot of convincing. Um, so those are my main concerns as a mom of teens. It's, it's something that I feel there is no way they can responsibly keep it out of minor's hands in a dark movie theater when you have an older person taking it in and drinking it. I just don't know how that would happen successfully over time. So thank you very much. Thanks, Colleen. Folks, anybody else? Very good. Uh, Jamie, did you want to try to address those, or would the owner want to try to address them? Council, is that fair? Is it fair? Or would you prefer to have the council kind of drive this? Uh, maybe we should make motions first to just see where we're at. So, uh, very good. Jamie, I'll have you sit then. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I did have another person here that I wanted to come forth. If, if, is this the time when we'd ask someone else to come up? Is I, there someone I just, from the- I did. No, I, I asked, that I, I was going to request, I talked to uh, Darren Smith from the pavilion. Is there someone from the pavilion here? Yeah. And so, I had. I was going to ask some questions of him, but I don't, sh you want me to wait on that? Okay. Should we move the, the 35, 35 through yeah. 59, and then we can focus on the last yeah, two? Very good. This, yeah. Most very good. of the questions are. So I'll move to approve um, items 35 through 59. And I second that. So I have a motion to approve items 35 through 59. It has been seconded. Any discussion? A roll call vote, please. Council members, Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed eight to zero. Thank you, Councilor. I think um, I think there's several um, people that have questions. I know Councilor Staley, you just uh, wanted the representative from the pavilion to come forward, so I think that's appropriate to start there. And then um, I think we certainly want to hear from 
um, the owner of West Mall um, to address the security alcohol policy and, and answer some of the questions from uh, Colleen that was here as well as some of the questions that we have. In full disclosure, I was one that did talk to Colleen earlier on the phone. I know this is quasi-judicial, so I want to um, just make mention the things that she communicated today were what we discussed on the phone today as well. Um, I did not, I did have um, two other people that did reach out to me, um, but it's all the same information that we've been hearing via email. So due to it being quasi-judicial, I just wanted to make sure I disclose that um, information. Thank you. You know, Council, with uh, the questions that Colleen asked, they're probably still fresh in our mind. Why don't we have the owner or the manager of uh, the uh, West Mall Theater? Would you mind coming forward first? Thank you. There were a couple of questions that uh, Miss or Mrs. Sorensen had asked. Sir, would you first introduce yourself and try to address those if you don't mind? Sure. How do you? Uh, Todd Frager, West Mall Seven Theaters, um, owner, manager. The, you know, the reason we talked about the liquor license over the last ten years is because the theater industry is leading that way. New theaters in big cities are printing beer, wine in, full alcohol, full restaurants. It's something we talked about and thought we would we would address here in Sioux Falls. But. You know, we're a family business. I mean, I've said those words hundreds of times over the last 15 years. And we certainly do not want to change that. You know, we certainly don't want <clears throat> to become a drinking establishment. I mean, we're there to show movies, right? So, but on top of that, we also don't just play family product. We play, you know, three billboards. We play Shape of Water. We, you know, movies that did very well for us, and that's an adult clientele. So our thought was, we have an opportunity, we have the space, and we thought we would offer potentially a beer wine um, for our customers, if they choose to use that. Then it becomes security, because we have kids, we have teenagers, and our proposal is, that we're going to, first of all, limit the area that you can buy it. So it's not, it's not like every person at the theater is going to be able to sell it. We're going to have one specific area that will be carted, banded, put into a specific glass into the theater. That person working that shift, or maybe two people, you know, if warranted, will handle all the sales for that shift. So, in essence of person going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, we're going to know they're going back and forth, back and forth. We, we don't want people to come to the West Mall 7 to drink. We want people to come to the West Mall 7 to go to a movie. If they want to have a beer or two during a movie, that's what we're looking for. If we feel that that third beer in 15 minutes is ridiculous, we're not going to sell it. And if that person gets upset and wants their money back, here's your 350, hit the road. We also do check auditoriums. We do walk the aisles. We do have upstairs where we can see in the auditoriums. And if there's, it's just, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example, R-rated shows, 13-year-olds, 14-year-olds. We have to monitor that. We have to monitor, you know, and if you've all been to the large screen complexes where kids buy their ticket and it's the way they go. Well, we have to monitor that where if a group of kids is in an R-rated show, maybe we have to go in and ask them for their ticket stuff. So we do monitor the auditoriums. The, if beer and wine adversely affects a show, we'll have to deal with that. Unfortunately, we have to deal with that now. If you, know, if you look in the records, in the last year I've had at least three people arrested because of you know levels of problems in the auditoriums that came from alcohol, whether they you know brought it, drank it somewhere else, I don't know, but we had to remove them from the auditorium and call the police. We deal we deal with that now, and we will continue to deal with that. We're going to be very careful about disruptive people. 
I think one of the analogies I use is we've all been to a ball game where that one fan or behind you or it's just really, you know, there's kids here and the language and things. I will say, you know, people don't tailgate before they go to a movie. You know, we are looking, it's a small part of our business that we're looking to enhance. The, we are gonna limit the hours. My original proposal was four to 10. So the 11 o'clock shows, one o'clock shows, three o'clock shows, we would not make it available. If there's, if we feel that it doesn't mix well at five o'clock, we may have to make an adjustment to six o'clock. If we feel that it doesn't mix well for any reason, we won't sell it. Because the last thing I want to do is jeopardize the business that we have. The, you know, the public in Sioux Falls, our customers, I mean, it's, it, the, the feedback is wonderful, you know, because it's, it's surprising to me sometimes when we decide to do something that the amount of feedback that we get. You know, everybody feels in Sioux Falls that the West Mall 7 is like their theater. And I do appreciate that. And all the comments that are made, we, you know, I take into great consideration. And I'd be any other questions or? Todd, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the council. Uh, councilors, um, or Councilor Staley, you had someone you wanted to speak yeah. from the Washington yes. Pavilion. Um, if you would. And uh, Todd, if you wouldn't mind staying pretty close, I'd appreciate it. Welcome. So, uh, be what is your name? Nick Saritas at the Washington Pavilion. I, um, in disclosure, because it's quasi-judicial, I also had a conversation with Colleen um, after she emailed us this morning, and I encouraged her to come today and testify, and thank you so much for that. Um, I was talking with a citizen about this issue, as we're supposed to disclose, and that citizen said, um, well, they let people drink at the pavilion, and they let them bring alcohol into their shows. And so I called Darren Smith this morning. We had a lovely conversation about how they handle things. And I said, gee, it'd be great if somebody from your organization came in. And just to, to summarize some of the things that Darren and I discussed is that when they do have a, their beer and wine sales are available during the whole concert. Um, and I've, I've been to symphony concerts. I haven't been to uh, like a Willie Nelson show there. Um, well, and we, it, it's not actually for the whole concert. We do cut off sales um, between 45 minutes to an hour before a show finishes. Okay. So, I mean, for concerts, it ends up being a little bit different because people will go in and come out and go in and come out, so the bar will stay open during that time. Uh, for like a Broadway show, though, it's open before the show, and then essentially it, the bar isn't closed, but nobody's leaving the auditorium. Then we're open for intermission, and then the bar is closed immediately afterwards. So we don't ever stay open until the very end. Okay, and then you are not limiting the amount, uh, the number of drinks is a patron can have. That is correct. And, no. and he said you're doing training on your bartenders. That is correct. Um, and training them in responsibility, and then you've got the liability issue covered as well. Absolutely. Um, so it, I'm not sure that if we're going to say this is apples to apples to what you're doing. Sure. Would you? As far as training? And, and, and as far as the limit, I mean. Well, we're going to shut down. Our concession Todd, stand shuts down at 10 o'clock. Can I have you come up to the mic, please? Thank you. Our concession stand shuts down at 10 o'clock, so we're going to, that'll be it. I mean, we'll stop at 10 o'clock. You know, our last movie's at 930, 940. So the final movie of the evening, will just they'll just be able to buy until 10 o'clock p.m. The, you know, as far as the, the, you know, the training, and yeah, I mean, we're not approved yet, obviously, if, if we get approved. But yeah, we'll do the necessary training, and I mean, we don't want to do anything wrong, and we don't want to adversely affect any of our customers, as, as, as anything. Well, and, and another difference that, that like, for a Willie Nelson show, the lights are on, or at the event center, sure. lights are on, people are interacting, right. they're, they're making noise. It's, it's, right. it's a, a little different environment than a movie yeah, theater. Yeah, the, the theater is well. very quiet. I mean, when, when you walk in an auditorium, when you walk down front and turn around, 
you know, you're, you feel like you're sitting in the dark, but when, when you walk out of, you know, like when we check auditoriums, when we're walking out, we can see very clearly because the light from the screen reflects on every one of, every one of our customers. And it's very quiet, so if there's a disruption, it's gonna be, you know, it's like, I mean, it's like a baby crying. I mean, it's like everybody in the theater knows there's a baby crying, and sometimes we have to address that also. You know, and it's, that disruption is just not gonna be tolerated. We can't tolerate that, because in a movie theater, we don't want cell phones ringing either. Um, as far as, you know, drinking, you know, we have great popcorn, and I have hardly ever have anybody come in just to sit and eat popcorn. You know, they go to a movie. I mean, that's what we're selling. And we don't anticipate selling multiples. If, if we have to limit it to, you know, I've been to some events where there's a two minimum, or two maximum, excuse me, where, you know, you can only buy two. If we have to do that, if we feel that that's necessary, we will. Councilor Steele, you did? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Councilor Neitzert. I have a question for the applicant. Can you talk to how you think um, realistically you would address the issue that was brought up of possibly a, uh, somebody over the age of 21 in a dark theater giving alcohol to somebody under the age of 21? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that if that's a ser you know, obviously a serious crime, number one, and so if, if someone risks that, if we feel that that's happened, we're gonna call the police and, and have them deal with it. I mean, you know, if we feel that somebody's sitting next to somebody and there's a couple beers there, or maybe, and one of the things that we wasn't brought up, and I'll bring it up, is what if that person just reaches over and takes a sip of that legal beverage? You know, that's something that we're gonna to have to be very aware of. And if there's, if there's teenagers in a group and somebody is 21, we're gonna be very careful about selling them a beverage. Could Councilor Neiser. I'm sorry. Could somebody? Uh, could maybe the city attorney or uh, somebody weigh in possibly on where does the security management plan fit into our considerations? I mean, I think we have suitable person and suitable location essentially as our. I don't think state law requires a security management plan. We we just do. You know, where does that yeah. does that fit in our thought process? Uh, thank you, Councillor Neitzer. Yes, under state law, uh, you will be looking whether or not the applicant is a suitable person to hold such license and whether it considers the proposed location suitable. Part of the factors a municipality can consider are the type of business which the applicant proposes to operate, the manner in which the business is operated, so I think that would fit into your business plan, the extent to which minors frequent or are employed in such a place of business, and uh, it also talks about the adequacy of the police facilities to properly police uh, uh, the proposed location. I don't think that's relevant here, as well as other factors which are inherently associated with the sale of alcohol beverages. That's right out of state law. Thank you. Councilor Silver. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You're Thanks, welcome. Mr. Frager, for being here tonight. A um, sure. question I would have, and I frequent your establishment a lot, and as you said, you have a reputation as a family business. I kind of understand what you're saying. You're trying to offer a service. It's not like you're you are offering to serve up a party which would jeopardize your business or have a, I don't picture this as being something where like you said, a tailgating, let's all meet an hour before wonder and right. do beer shooters in the front. I get that part too. But you know, when I'm there, I notice you have a pretty young staff. Right. So are you retooling if this were to go through as far as who it, and it's kind of a two-part I mean obviously there's younger people around the counter you, who would be handling the right. beer portion that you talked about and then if there's trouble like you said we're gonna have a, a system where I believe and I lost my place on here but I think you said somebody gets one warning and then they're out are, are these younger people that are taking tickets and that too are they right. helping on security are they i mean i guess staff part in that and enforcement was part of my question yeah the older i get the staff gets younger every year right but right now we're about 50 percent about 50 percent of my employees are over 21 the other 50 percent are under um our when you when i talked about policy as far as disruptive in the auditorium i'm talking about just normal things if there's a problem in an auditorium a door person will go in there and give a warning the second time, it's a manager that would go in 
and remove. Okay. Now, if we're talking about alcohol situation, that's different. I mean, if we feel that somebody's, you know, if there's an underage problem or if some, you know, we're going to remove them right away and talk to them out in the lobby. And if we have to, we'll call the authorities if it's, a, if it's an identification or underage. The, you know, the police have been very, very good to deal with when I have a problem at the theater. They come out, they, you know, and then it's, they take over. They talk to the people, they interview them, and unfortunately sometimes they handcuff them and sometimes they write them a, you know, whatever they, a ticket or, or whatever. But, but the, the enforcement is removal is always done by a management person. And obviously the, the door people are kind of like our, you know, they, they monitor. If there's a warning, you know, for instance, you got your feet up on the chair, that's a warning. Now the second time, we're probably not gonna kick you out of the theater, but that's a warning. But if it's alcohol related, then we're gonna have to have a management person in there. Okay, can I have one more? So this four o'clock time, it wouldn't start till four. Um, that, that's our plan right now, but we, right. yeah. I guess what I'm thinking, you know, when I'm around there, and again, like, I see the concern on the other side too. There are a lot of kids around, you've got Hoovers across the way, you see that type of thing. I mean, if it was a little bit later, if it started at seven, would it be, well, it's not worth it, it's three hours, or is that something you might, if by chance this doesn't go this way, is that? Well, to do this, we have to sell so many units per week to make it worth our while. Okay. If it doesn't sell well enough, we're not going to continue it because why, you know, why would you? It's just like a candy item. If it doesn't sell, we get rid of it. Junior mints are just hanging on, right? So with this beverage, if, if 6 o'clock makes more sense, then we, may, then we may do that. And that's something that I'm open to. The 10 p.m., I'm not going to keep it open after 10 p.m. because it's just, you know what, you can get your one. It's just, it's just not worth it. It's not going to be cost effective for us. And we don't need it late at, later at night. Right. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Councilor Buck. Thank you. You're welcome. I too uh, thank you for providing the business that you provide. Just that affordable family entertainment is is valuable. My first concern is that junior mints are just hanging on by a thread. <laughs> People, you need to buy junior mints. I'm telling right, you. Right. Uh, but yeah, bring your own, right? No, no, no. We don't do that. We don't do that. Uh, I'm, actually, my question, though, is seriously, is for um, uh, Attorney Leonard, if I might. Um, I know um, that we have um, ordinances in Sioux Falls, and I don't know if it's state law, but I think it's it's city ordinance that we um, won't allow video lottery um, establishments within a certain um, distance from schools and parks, places where children, where minors would be frequenting. I wonder if we have that same sort of rule for liquor and beer licenses. I know that you have to, it's connected, right? Because you have to have a liquor license in order to have video lottery. And I know that rule is about video lottery, but I don't know that it's about liquor. To my understanding, um, it's, it's related to video lottery and not to liquor, not that we don't liquor. have ordinances that establish how far away uh, right. Okay. A liquor establishment has to be away from parks or children or anything like okay. that. Okay. So, so here's my thing for my colleagues and for you, sir. I, I, when I first saw this idea, I think it's a great idea. I really do. I have been to establishments. I've watched movies in establishments where I could have a glass of wine. It was a wonderful experience. But the difference for me is twofold. One, those were in buildings that were um, standalone buildings, and so the controls. I felt like, as I think back over that, the controls were, were better. And the other, this is the biggest piece for me, and this comes from public input that what didn't happen tonight. It came from public input that we got from people who email us. We get tons of input all the time. And this came from folks who emailed us about that idea of how many children are so close to that facility on so so frequently until nine o'clock hoover's is i just checked their website hoover's is open until nine o'clock almost every night of the week and so my concern is as a parent because i did i had three teenagers i had three little kids and i would go to that go to west mall theaters and i really don't want to deal with someone that's had a couple drinks coming sure. out of there and that's and so if i'm you know I, i'm either at hoover's or i'm at at the movies i don't want to have to deal with those 
folks with my kids. And so for me, I'm, I'm voting against both of these items because number one, it's not a standalone building, and number two, it is just far too close to where tons and tons of kids are, and I want them, to, them and their families to have those experiences. And I know what you're looking for to boost your business, but I'm, I, can't, yeah. I can't vote in favor of this one. And there, there are also- I'm uh, just gonna- just, Oh, sorry. Thank you, sir. Uh, Councilor, uh, before I go back to Councilor Neitzert, anybody else? Very good, Councilor Neitzert, sir. Thank you. I just wanted to say I, lo I largely echo what Councilor Erpenbach had shared. I think my major concerns are the extent to which miners frequent the establishment plus the proximity of the other businesses nearby that have miners and really the, um, whether or not it can be realistically policed. So I will not support this as well. Here. Councilor Rolfi. Um, I'm not going to support this either, and, and the reasons that I'm looking at is that I think we're also setting a precedence here for when the next theater comes. And um, I, I don't like this idea of, minor, of the miners, um, and miners go to theaters all the time, even at 7 o'clock at night. And so I just think it's a bad idea, it's bad precedence, and I'll be voting against it. As much as I like the entrepreneurship that's there, I, um, uh, you know, I, 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 w I would like to say that as I, far as the West, I, I, I can't say anything. Yeah, I'm this sorry. is within oh, the council I'm sorry. right now. I'm sorry. The council is doing their work. If the council oh, wants you to say something, they'll they'll make that recommendation or they'll ask you a question. Okay. So, did anybody have a comment for? Mr. I actually, Mr. Mayor, just Councilor out of courtesy, Mark? because he has no remained problem. to answer our questions, no I would open that to Thank you. For, I, I for your response. I, I just wanted to address that. Yeah, no, I understand that. The Western Mall does have an establishment right now that serves beer you know we got a casino down at the end of the hallway and you know the restaurant out front serves alcohol they have full liquor the as you know as far as a, a family establishment you know the first time I went to Chuck E Cheese I'm like really there's beer here and that's that's kind of where I'm confused a little bit because Chuck E Cheese they their target audience is this tall mm-hmm Right, and I don't, and I, I don't mean to pick on them specifically, but I would just, I just like you to keep that in mind that that precedent was set, you know, 20 years ago. Thanks, Todd. Good point. Uh, Council Chair Kelly, I, I would just like to address that point, and I, and I won't have any further questions for you. But thank okay. you very much. Thank um, you. You know, I think the difference between a restaurant like Chuck E. Cheese is the the parents aren't just going to drop the children off. Somebody does have to pay for the bill once they're done consuming <laughs> their cheeseburgers and whatever else Pizza. to serve. Pizza. Pizza. You can tell that I've stayed away from <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese. But uh, so, and, and, and I think it comes down to a supervision thing, uh, especially at our, this theater, and, and I do thank you too for offering the, the low cost movies, but it's, it's one too where, where parents can drop their children off for the movie and they're left unattended, and then they come back and pick them up again. So I think it's a situation of one scenario, they're supervised by adults, another scenario, they are not. So I, I do agree with the concerns that my other counselors have, colleagues have expressed. Thank you. Counselors, for purposes of um, further discussion as well as voting on these two topic, topics, would anybody want to make a motion uh, to approve items 33 and 34? So moved, Star. Thank Second you, Councilor Star. Back. Thank you, Councilor Bach. Is there any further discussion? A roll call, please. Council members. Uh, we're doing a 33 and 34. Okay. Council member Neitzert? No. Rolfing? No. Selberg? No. Star? No. Staley? No. Erickson? No. Erpenbach? No. Kylie? No. That has failed zero to eight. Thank you. Item number <coughs> 60. 60, please. Item 60 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances for Chapter 156, Floodplain Management. Jason Bieber representing Planning and Building Services. Uh, planning staff is requesting that this uh, item be deferred to the Wednesday, May 2nd City Council meeting. Jason, thank you. So moved. Thank you, Council Vice Second. Chair. Thank you, Council Chair. A roll call, please. Council Member Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. 
Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has failed, uh, or that has passed 8 to 0. Item 61? Item 61 is a second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending the Code of Ordinances of the City by amending Chapter 160, Zoning Subchapter on Premises Sign Regulations. Uh, city staff is also requesting this one be deferred to the Wednesday, May 2nd City Council meeting. So moved, Erickson. Second, second Neitzert. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Erickson made that motion second by Councilor Neitzert. A roll call vote, please. Council Members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 62. Item 62 is a second reading, an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located south of West Benson Road and east and west of Northwestport Avenue from the I-1 Light Industrial District to the S-2 Institutional Campus Planned Unit Development District, petition number 7983-2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5-0. to zero. Uh, The applicant and owner here is Sanford Health. Uh, it's located south of West Benson Road and east and west of uh, North Westport Avenue. Uh, it's roughly two, 200, or excuse me, 324 acres. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is uh, Sanford is looking at continuing to develop uh, their sports complex. Uh, this would be south of Benson Road. Jason, thank you. Folks, this is a second reading. Did anybody want to discuss this item with the council? Councilors? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Selberg. Councilor Rolfing has made a motion to approve this item. Second by Councilor Selberg. A roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 63. Item 63 is an ordin a second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at the southwest corner of East 26th Street and South Veterans Parkway from the AG Agricultural District to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban RD1 Twin Home Duplex Residential Suburban, RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density, RA3 Apartment Residential High Density, O Office, LW Live Work, C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar C3 Commercial Community and CN Conservation Districts. Petition number 8039, 2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval five to zero. Jason. Uh, the applicant here is Eric Wildson. The owner is Jay Kappeman. It is located at the southwest corner of East 26th Street and South Veterans Parkway. It's roughly 218 acres. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is they're looking at constructing a future residential, office, and commercial development. Folks, again, a second reading. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move, move to, to approve, approve. Neitzert. Second, Councilor Neitzert has made a motion to approve this item. Seconded by Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0. Thank you. Item 64. Item 64 is a second reading. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located north of East Madison Street and east west of North Veterans Parkway from the LW Live Work and C2 Commercial Neighborhood and Streetcar Districts to the CN Conservation District, petition number 8092-2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval, five to zero. Uh, the applicant and owner here is the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, it is located north of East Madison Street and east to west of Veterans Parkway. Uh, it's roughly uh, 10 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is the city is looking at constructing a future uh, regional detention pond. Thanks, Chase. Did anybody want to engage the council on this topic? Councilors? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Erpenbach. Council Rolfing has been a motion to approve this item. Say by Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 65. Item 65 is a second reading an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located south of East 57th Street and west of South Greystone Avenue from the LW Live Work District to the CN Conservation <laughs> District, number 8093, 2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5 to 0. Uh, the applicant and owner is also the City of Sioux Falls. Uh, it's located uh, south of East 57th Street, east of South Southeastern Avenue, and west of South Greystone Avenue. 
Uh, it's roughly 66 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is we're looking at matching uh, the proposed zoning with the existing detention pond use of the property. Folks, again, a second reading. Anybody? Councilors? Move to approve, Urban Mark. Second, Rolf. Councilor Boxman, motion to approve this item. Second by Councilor Rolfing. Any roll call, please. Council Members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 66. Item 66 is an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located south of East 69th Street and west of South Southeastern Avenue from the AG Agricultural and RS Single Family Residential Suburban Districts to the RS Single Family Residential Suburban and RD2 Townhome Residential Suburban Districts. Petition number 8102, 2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5 to 0. Uh, the applicant in order here is Brady Hyde with Empire Homes. Uh, it's located south of East 69th Street, uh, just east of Sioux Falls Christian High School and west of South Southeastern Avenue. Uh, it's roughly 41 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning uh, is the applicant is looking at constructing some twin home townhomes adjacent to 69th Street and then some single family uses as you start heading south. Thanks, Jason. Folks, again, a second reading. Anybody want to engage the council? Councilors? Move approval, Rolfing. Second, Selberg. Council Rolfing's made a motion to approve this item. Second, my Councilor Selberg. A roll call, please. Council Members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 7 to 0. Item 67. Item 67 is an ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, rezoning property located at 617 South Main Avenue from the RA2 Apartment Residential Moderate Density District to the RT1 Single Family Residential Traditional District, petition number 8107, 2018, and amending the official zoning map of the City of Sioux Falls. Planning Commission recommends approval 5 to 0. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Kathy Knobloch. It is located at uh, 617 South Main Avenue, just south of 14th Street. It's about 0.17 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this rezoning is uh, we're looking at matching the zoning with the existing use of the property, which is a single family residential. Jason, thank you. A, a second reading. Anybody want to engage the council? Councilors? Move to approve, Urban Mark. Second, Rolfing. Councilor Box made a motion to approve item 67, seconded by Councilor Rolfing. A roll call, please. Council Members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. Councilor Starr, did you want to vote? Yes. Very good. That's 8-0. Uh, Thank you. Item 68. Item 68 is a first reading to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, April 17th, 2018 at 7 p.m. for item 68. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, authorizing the mayor to execute and record quit claim deeds of vacated right of way. Diane. Diane Best, appearing on behalf of Public Works. Uh, earlier this year, this council vacated three small parcels of right of way on the north side of Arrowhead Parkway between Arrowhead, between um, Sycamore and Veterans Parkway. Um, they were not needed for street improvements. They won't be needed for these new improvements that are uh, going, going to be installed this year. The city has no longer has an interest in those right-of-ways except for uh, utilities. So they were vacated. Uh, each of the property owners has now asked the city to issue a quick, <coughs> excuse me, to issue a quick claim deed confirming that the city no longer claims an interest. Uh, I've reviewed the matter. The city, by state law, they would no the city would no longer have an interest except for those utility easements, and therefore, there's no reason not to issue a quit claim deed to confirm that the city uh, holds no right title or interest other than the utility easements. According to city charter, an ordinance is necessary to issue a deed, even though it is not a deed that uh, really, in my opinion, uh, conveys any interest. But uh, in the eyes of the, of the uh, property owner, uh, they wish to have a quick claim deed to confirm that. And since it's a deed, uh, it will be necessary to have an ordinance. And so I would recommend that the council uh, move forward with the ordinance, or uh, with the second hearing on the 17th. 
Council, would anybody want to set a date of hearing uh, and second reading for Tuesday, April 17th for this? So moved. And second. Council Chair, thank you. Council Rolfing, thank you. A roll call vote, please. Council Members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Salberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 69. Item 69 is a first reading to set a date of hearing and second reading for Tuesday, April 17th, 2018 at 7 p.m. An ordinance of the City of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, amending Chapter 51 of the Code of Ordinances of the City pertaining to new and expanding industrial electric customers. Good evening, Jerry, City of Sioux Falls Public Works, uh, Light Power and Traffic Superintendent. I'm here to present an ordinance to, uh, to change the incentive rate. Uh, oh, excuse me. Thank you. Present an ordinance to change um, the electric rate to allow incentive for new large load customers. Um, for a background, the city of Sioux Falls purchases power from two main suppliers. We have WAPA and Heartland Power. That power is brought to the city of Sioux Falls through transmission lines owned by XL Energy. One of those partners, Heartland, offers a large load incentive rate for expanding new business, uh, bring them to the, the local uh, communities. So two, three of the rules for this large load incentive rate to, to allow the city to have this. One, the customer has to have one over one, one megawatt of power. Two, the rate cannot, not longer, cannot be effective for longer than five years. And three, it must not impact the standard rates of any of the existing customers of that community. The total rate is negotiated agreement and for the city and it allows the facilities charge, and that rate is then passed through directly from the Heartland Power Company to the city of Sioux and then passed directly to the customer. Each particular agreement with a large load to customer um, will be brought in front of the city council for approval. The large load incentive program allows Heartland, our power provider, to bring incentive rates to these customers. The new language allowed in the electrical rate ordinance will allow the public works director to negotiate an agreement with large load customers to utilize this incentive rate and recover any cost to uh, facilities charges. Um, we would like, uh, yeah, any questions please? Jerry, thank you. Council, any questions? Yes, Councilor Neisert. Is this just a pass through and revenue neutral to us, or does it have a cost to us? It is a pass through uh, revenue neutral, and any uh, costs allowed with this, we recover through a facilities charge to the large loan customer. Okay, thank you. Councilor, thank you. Council, I'll move, I'll thank move you. for the second reading to be held on the 17th of April. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Second, Erpenbach. Thank you, Councilor Erpenbach. A roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. And that is uh, pass 8 to 0, item 70. Item 70 is a resolution of intent to enter into, into a lease of municipal real property. Good evening, Diane Best appearing on behalf of Public Works. State law requires notice of intent to lease real property. The city of Sioux Falls leases real property uh, for farm leases. Uh, we do tower leases on top of water towers and we lease some drainage property in green space. Uh, state law requires the notice of intent to lease and you may remember this from last year. This provides that property is up for leases or available for lease, the actual leases would be brought to you later as specific leases are entered into. And so this is a state law requirement that a resolution be uh, uh, made and that the matter be published. Diane, thank you. Folks, it's a resolution. You do have the opportunity to engage the council on this topic if you want. Councilor Neisert. So we are not entering into a lease tonight. We're just stating our intent to enter into leases. That's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Move for approval, Neitzert. Second, Erpenbach. Councilor Neitzert, Councilor Erpenbach, thank you. A uh, roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Balfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? 
Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is fast eight to zero, item 71. Item 71 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of Sanford Sports Complex South Edition. Uh, Jason Bieber again here. Uh, the applicant and owner here is Sanford Health. Uh, this is located just south of the existing Sanford Sports Complex and goes along with the rezoning that we had earlier in the night. Um, it's roughly 145 acres. And they're looking at uh, doing their preliminary subdivision plan for phase one of the Sanford Sports Complex uh, South Edition. Thank you. Folks, anybody want to engage the council? Councilors? I'll move approval. Second, Salbert. Thank you. Uh, Councilors, a roll call vote, please. Council members, Neisert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed. Eight to zero. Item 72. Item 72 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls approving the preliminary plan of Dakota Prairie East Edition. Uh, the applicant in here is Dave Gibbon. The owner is Doug Allen. Uh, it's located south of East 69th Street and east of South Southeastern Avenue. It's about 37.11 acres in size. Uh, the purpose of this preliminary subdivision plan is they're looking at constructing two office lots adjacent to 69th Street. Uh, then there'll be several uh, single family and twin home lots as you start heading south. Thank you, Jason. Folks, anybody want to engage the council? Councilors? I'll move approval. Rolfing. Second, Selberg. Councilor Rolfing has made that motion. Seconded by Councilor Selberg. A roll call vote, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Sel yes. Selberg? Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed. Eight to zero. Item 73. Item 73 is a resolution severing phase one and phase two of the Basin 17 sanitary sewer cost recovery and determining the cost recovery for phase one has been satisfied. Good evening, Ryan Johnson with the City of Sioux Falls uh, Engineering Department. Uh, just to begin to get orientated, the Basin 17 uh, service area is shown uh, in the map off to the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, very generally, it's east of I-229 to the north of the Big Sioux River. Uh, the water reclamation facility is in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, the new Gage Brother facility is uh, near the center of the screen. And when I speak about uh, phase one sewer, that's uh, the magenta line near the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's got a leader line and a call out uh, to that. And the uh, phase two sewer is uh, the black dashed line that is uh, near the center of the screen. Uh, just backing up a little bit more to give a little more history and background, the Basin 17 cost recovery was uh, was done in 17 uh, or in 2015. It put uh, all the property owners on notice that these two projects would be constructed and at some point in the future, when they connected to the sanitary sewer, the cost associated with that infrastructure would be charged back or collected back uh, to the city on a dollars per acre basis. So this is a, a, a little bit of a unique project where uh, the phase one sewer was installed by the city, but 100% of the cost from the engineering to the contractors, to the geotechnical, to the uh, easement acquisition was paid for by the property owner that's inside the red area. Uh, the phase two cost would be uh, done at some point in the future. It's currently not in the capital plan. The total cost when looked at uh, for the phase one sewer uh, was very close to the amount they would have had to pay for that cost recovery. It's about $62 difference on a per acre basis. Uh, so the feeling is that uh, to make those gauge, those areas inside the red uh, a little more firm and price secure when it's time to sell and market those lots uh, would be to separate this area from the overall cost recovery and say that that area has been uh, paid in full. Advantage is, uh, again, that it's all the price on that land is in uh, uh, a price secured and it's known and given. Uh, the city won't have to come back and either try to collect more money on an acre basis or even reimburse potentially on an acre basis to any properties, uh, potentially five years, 10 years, potentially even 15, 20 years from now. Uh, and then it also, allows for the benefiting properties of the phase two area 
to pay their proportionate share uh, in the future when that area is constructed. So with that, I'd be happy to answer questions or try to answer questions. Thank you very much. Did anybody in the audience want to speak to this item? Councilor uh, Neitzert. Thank you. Could you give us an example of where you would have to reimburse? You made a reference to that? Sure, Technically sure. Technically how that ha would happen? So, so it's uh, normally the way it's done is all sewer is installed, so you've got a fixed cost. Uh, and um, it's charged on that per acre basis again. Um, where we've done it in the past, where we've had future projects that is not reimbursed or collected, uh, the unbuilt portion is increased annually on an inflationary basis. So there's never a look back at, did it cost more or did it cost less? We're just charging what an engineer's estimate would be to construct that piece. Yeah. So we're trying to avoid that situation. I see. Councilor Rolfe. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, where is the new Gage Brothers um, plant going to be hooked up? To the phase one? Yes, that, okay. a good, good point also that uh, that area inside the red is almost exclusively served uh, by that phase one sanitary sewer. So um, it goes, I don't know if I have a pointer here, but generally where that magenta line ends, uh, all the flow to that area would follow that ravine and uh, to the north and to the northwest. Okay, thank you. Councilor, anybody want to make a motion? So, so moved, Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Second. Thank you, Councilor Chair. Appreciate it. A roll call, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That is passed 8 to 0, item 74. Item 74 is a resolution approving the release of existing 20 feet sanitary sewer easement located in lot 26B in block 7 of reserve addition to the city of Sioux Falls, Lincoln County, South Dakota. Diane Best representing Public Works again. Uh, this resolution pertains to a sanitary sewer easement that was acquired by the city of Sioux Falls through uh, platting in, in the plat filed in 2014. Uh, the plat can take granted a, a sanitary sewer easement across a private lot uh, in that is located south of Ralph Rogers near uh, Old Yankton Trail. Uh, and the sanitary sewer had yet to be installed in a portion of that neighborhood. Uh, the sanitary sewer was ultimately installed last summer in that neighborhood, and the uh, design ended up uh, not. Uh, not being planned to use for for that particular sanitary sewer easement. No sanitary sewer has been installed in this lot or in this easement at all, and none is planned. The landowner has asked that the easement be uh, uh, released, and the resolution is for that purpose. Thanks, Diane. Appreciate it. Uh, folks, anybody in the audience want to speak to this? Councilors? Move to approve Erpenbach. Second, Selberg. Councilor Blake has made a motion to approve that. Uh, seconded by Councilor Selberg. A roll call, please. Council members Neitzert? Yes. Rolfing? Yes. Selberg? Yes. Starr? Yes. Staley? Yes. Erickson? Yes. Erpenbach? Yes. Kylie? Yes. That has passed 8 to 0, item 75. <clears throat> item 75 is a resolution advising and giving consent to the appointment of members to certain citizen boards, those being Noxan, ADA Accessible. Accessibility Review Board, Alyssa Schmidt, Arena Convention Entertainment Center Board, Rachel Meyerink, Board of Historic Preservation, Morgan Jackson, Disability Awareness Commission, Jolene Kranz, Jonathan Oppold, Garrett Wilson, Orpheum Theater Advisory Board of Directors, Jerry Reed, Public Transit Advisory Board, Nancy Wallstrom, Sioux Falls Regional Emergency Medical Services Authority, Richard Byrath and Brian Vognild, Veterans Memorial Park Advisory Board, Kellen Boyce, Visual Arts Commission. Thank you very much. Folks, are any of those candidates here t uh, tonight? Sure. Very good. We still thank them for their service. Uh, Council, anybody? 
Move to approve Erickson. Thank you, Councilor Erickson. Second, Rolfing. Thank you, Councilor Rolfing. Any roll call, please. Council members Neitzert. Yes. Rolfing. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Starr. Yes. Staley. Yes. Erickson. Yes. Erpenbach. Yes. Kylie. Yes. Pass pass eight to zero. Item 76. Item 76 is a report of the March 14th, 2018 notice of transfer of appropriations within major organizational units. Thank you. Item 77. Item 77 is a resolution of the City of Sioux Falls requesting the release of any Falls Park safety studies which belong to the city after January 1, 2008. Thank you. Jim. Oh, I'm yes. sorry. Councilor Staley. Yeah. Um, I, uh, this is uh, relating directly to the incident that we had a few weeks ago at the Falls. We lost another life. And um, right after that happened, I expressed concern publicly that I think there needed to be some fencing down in this area because it, it's a problematic area where we've had foam coming up to the, to the rocks. We've lost three lives in this particular area. And I, I would like to see some kind of a barrier in the spring um, or just a railing or some kind of fencing, especially during that springtime foam um, situation and it was during that that conversation that the Parks Department came out and uh, or the safe the city came out with Reagan Smith and said that they had been advised in the past uh, I and I was thinking it was the 2016 safety audit that fencing would be a hindrance to um, rescue efforts and that was why there was no additional fencing ever put up and as we were asking for that information and asking for that report to be released I created a resolution um, and Councillor Starr was with me on that and I brought that I, I said uh, to the council last Tuesday at open discussion <laughs> that I was going to do that and I know Councillor Erickson said that if they brought forth that information that report would I drop the resolution and at that time I said I would and the next day the city came out and said that there there wasn't a safety audit but it was a safety study but within that information we've still never heard any verification or validation as to why we were told fencing would hinder law enforcement or rescue efforts so councillor Starr was on board to continue on with this resolution and have an amendment to it and what I'm looking for is just information for the public and for us so I and uh, our attorney Karen Leonard um, has approved this but I'm looking to broaden this informational gathering to the last 10 years of any audits or safety studies that have been done so that we know where we're starting moving forward and then we can decide where we're going to go but I think the public would like to know what actually was in these studies and or audits and so that is why I'm bringing this forward folks uh, as a resolution did anybody want to speak to this item Ruth Danielson I go to a lot of meetings that this town has and I ask for information and I'm often poo-pooed told it's not available, not available to the public. And I get, when I do finally get the information, I often wonder, you know, why did we get blocked from doing it? Uh, I know the circumstances that the gag order got put in. I was, a, because a lot of this is done because, because I'm not media, they just got to block me from asking for the questions found it very interesting the game that was played in getting this resolution back before the council. And that the game that got played and the reason why it could get put on the agenda prior to noon on the Monday before the meeting is because we had a special meeting at the regular time with the regular agenda that I filed an open meetings violation on and caused a lot of consternation because this body does not follow its own rules and laws. We've seen that with the executive orders. We've seen it with all kinds of things. Even just tonight, yesterday in Janet Brecky's press conference, it shows that this city doesn't even follow its own ordinances and rules. I want to see these reports. 
I want to know why that bridge almost collapsed last Monday. This, this council needs to ask these questions. These count, this council needs to get involved and find out what's going on behind the scenes. I think this needs to be passed. If it doesn't get passed, we've got some more work to do to get this stuff out, and we're going to have that information. And if there's people in this administration and in this town, going back to the, the collapse of the building downtown, we've, we're losing people, we're losing property, and there's an administration here that just doesn't care. Thank you. Folks, uh, did anybody else want to engage the council on this topic? Council? Councilor Neitzert? Thank you. Um, first of all, I have to appreciate the irony that something that purports to be a transparency ordinance has sprung on the public and us with basically a day notice. I, you know, I, I don't even know why this is on the agenda. If there's something you want as a counselor, you just pick up the phone and you ask. It's just a simple courtesy and it's not real hard. After we learned there was no safety audit, I picked up the phone and I expressed my desire we get a new evaluation of Falls Park. I've asked that we review the most recent tragedy that we bring the entire team together, that we bring in an outside firm or expertise if need be, that the council be fully briefed and involved on the results of that analysis, and that we be involved and informed as to changes, if any, that we decide to go forward with. I've received that assurance from Director Kearney and others, and we all received an email today reaffirming that promise. A resolution like this is something you do after you exhaust all of the normal options. It's an, ultimatum, it's an ultimatum and it's incredibly hostile. I asked for any safety studies to be provided to the council after I saw this resolution and I received assurance from the parks director that anything pertinent will be provided. This is the 10 years of information. Uh, it takes a little time to look for that much information if, it, if there is any and to figure out exactly what a safety study is. And so that just takes a little bit of time. And uh, I didn't need a resolution to do any of that. I just picked up the phone. In all honesty, I'm far less concerned about what was done 10 years ago than I am about what we do going forward. We lost a beautiful little girl to a tragedy. That's what we should be focusing on. And I think we've lost sight of that. I'm much more interested in a new analysis in light of the recent tragedy and what we can do going forward rather than looking backward. Did the administration make mistakes in this? Absolutely. Someone misspoke and they were filling in for someone who had, who had first-hand knowledge. It was an honest mistake, I believe. The biggest mistake, however, was not in correcting that misstatement quickly. That made it far worse and the administration has already paid dearly for that in the court of public opinion and in the media. And I don't see any reason to continue piling on tonight. So I have to ask, what are we actually trying to accomplish here tonight? Are we trying to find a real solution to make Falls Park safer going forward? Or is this a cynical ploy to get on the 10 o'clock news by exploiting a tragedy? Day in and day out, most of us get answers and solutions for our constituents. We do that by building effective and professional relationships with city staff. That doesn't mean we always agree. It just means we work together with mutual respect and communication. We don't need resolutions. We just ask for the information and we get the job done. This doesn't get us any closer to a solution. The only purpose seems to be to grab headlines and it's not productive. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to respond to that, please. Yeah, can, just before, is there anybody else before I go to Councilor uh, Staley who started, can I, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarah, Mayor. We'll get back to you, I swear. Um, last Racing. week, we did have the conversation in the uh, four o'clock meeting, and it went a little bit like this. Christine, I would be curious if it can be just made public without having to do the resolution. Otherwise, this would be the next necessary step. Councillor Staley, exactly. And if that does not, if that report does not become available, then of course this would me. We would just do it, Councillor er, Councillor Staley. That's right. That wouldn't happen. There was some additional follow-up um, on transparency. Finally ending with Councillor Staley saying, hopefully we won't have to even address this resolution because we'll get this information. And for me, this is key. We asked for it, someone misspoke. I think it was a very unfortunate situation that they did misspeak. But this doesn't get us any closer to making having workable solutions. I would invite you to the Public Services Committee meeting, uh, emergency management, uh, 
police, fire, <coughs> whomever is involved, to come and report, one, to all of this council. I know you want, I know this whole council wants to have that. But if it needs to be done in a task force to where we want to come to public services, I welcome, welcome you to that committee. I really do. I think it's productive in the committees. I think that we're able to flush some stuff out, um, discuss any potential changes that should take place. But I also welcome the opportunity for it to be at an informational meeting. We have to find solutions to make something safer and not just look backwards. I think it's safe to say that we all here deeply care about the folks that visit our Falls Park, and we do not want to see another death ever there. I hope that uh, we can move forward. I hope that we can come up with workable solutions. I hope we can learn more that um, there has been things done over the last couple of years, far more than this training exercise that was taken place. I understand someone <clears throat> misspoke, and I do agree they've paid dearly publicly for it. I hope that we can move forward and work together respectfully and find workable solutions. Thank you. Councillor Silberg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, Councillor Staley reached out to me last week about the ordinance, and I did understand the intent last week, and I appreciated the goal um, in the wake of the events of the last week. And this new ordinance I was not really told about, nor do I understand what the goal is, is apparently this can be done without an ordinance. Um, I, too, am about finding some answers to this tragedy and getting somewhere and getting something done. I don't see this moving us anywhere towards the direction of that goal. Um, again, if we're going to keep bringing this up and it's another media cycle and we're going to kind of raise the issue, let's do that to try to find an answer. Um, looking for another opportunity to slap the administration around or punish, I don't necessarily think that's getting us closer to what the real goal should be here. So I will not be supporting this. Thank you. Council Chair. Thank you. Um, well, let me echo some of what we've already heard by stating we're all interested in the safety of our, of our parks and in the entire city, for that matter. And I'm certain that all of my colleagues here uh, and administration uh, and administrative staff share our concern over the recent tragedy. Uh, it's unlikely. I'll support an amended resolution for the following reasons. One, the sponsors of this resolution asked for and received the information, but then through a very recent, as Councillor Neitzert's already addressed, amendment, um, I, I, I've not seen the transparency in that. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, only Councillor Neitzert was even contacted about the amendment. The rest of us are learning about it here this evening. The, um, as Councillor Erickson stated, um, one of the sponsors already publicly stated that if we received the information that was originally requested, they with, would withdraw the re resolution. Obviously, we're here tonight. They did not. So to date, neither sponsor have contacted and requested uh, this information from any of the individuals on the side of the administration that are involved in this issue. And I've confirmed this through communications with Park Director Kearney, Fire and Rescue Chief Goodroad, Police Chief Burns, uh, Regan Smith with Fire and Rescue, and Mike Hall with Risk Management. None of them have been contacted requesting this, this new information that is before us this evening. So having said all of the above, it appears that the motivation behind this matter is more about it drawing attention to a select few individuals versus actually addressing the situation by doing the necessary upfront work. I know that there has been a lot of discussion too about establishing relationships and sometimes there's been some criticism of, of those of us that have relationships with staff and administration um, that we're getting information that others are not. Um, but maybe you should look at the ways, if that's the case, maybe you should simply look at the ways in which you operate. First and foremost, you must be willing to reach out and communicate. Working through the press may garner attention, but it's not an effective way at dealing with issues or solving problems. You have to deal with the other members of, the, of this body. Furthermore, 
leaking attorney client privileged emails to the blog, which happened this past Friday morning, forwarding emails to the press, and publicly calling staff liars. The, the exact words were, city officials out and out lied, thus disparaging their reputations. This happened in a television interview by one of our counselors just this past evening. These actions might provide you with some hints as to why you don't experience the same relationship that other uh, counselors uh, on this body have with city staff. And I'm not saying that there's never a time to go to, a, go to the press. Actually, the press can be a very useful tool, but rarely <clears throat> should it be the one and only way in which to approach and to resolve issues. Lastly, I've been told, as Councillor Neitzert has been, and by the way, both of us asked for that information because, and, and we actively reached out, but we've been, excuse me, we've been told that the information requested will be provided as soon as staff can put it together. I have no reason to believe that we, this body, will not receive the requested information. So as a result of the above, I'm not willing to set a precedent of allowing members of this body to legislate through the media and through resolutions without first performing their due diligence. I encourage my colleagues to vote no on this resolution. Councilor Buck. Thank you. I just wanted to thank my colleagues for being so well versed, for doing your homework, for, as Councilor Kiley alluded, creating those relationships that are so important to a to a collaborative body like this one is. There are eight members to the city council and we have to be able to work together as colleagues and we also have to be able to work together with the administration. It takes work and it doesn't start with a phone call or a forwarded email to a media. And so I support uh, the efforts of the team and we'll be voting against this. Not because I because I, I, I do believe that, this, that Falls Park needs to be looked at, but it's not in this way. This is not the way that we handle things. We don't legislate by going to the media first, and we have to focus on what's right here. And I just, I'm just embarrassed that we're politicizing a tragedy of this magnitude. It's embarrassing. Councilor Rolfing. Thank you. I'm going to make it short and sweet. I was chastised in, in the open... Um, uh, our public output this afternoon uh, for doing exactly uh, what I'm doing, what we, we should be, what they're saying other people are doing or we're doing. Um, you know, it, it, saying something at, in, in, a, uh, in a TV interview about just what everybody else has said here tonight about uh, going to the public, working with, uh, working collaboration with everybody, and I would, I would um, urge my colleagues on the bench or on the, on the council to, uh, it's an old saying that you get a lot more with honey than you do with vinegar. And I would, uh, I would <coughs> urge them to think about that and I will not be supporting this for all the reasons that have already been said. Councilor Starr, did you have a comment, sir? I'm good. Very good. Councilor Staley? Well, first of all, um, yeah, we, we've, you've given me a great tongue lashing here. I will never collaborate with co corruption. And we have had secrecy. Wait, wait uh, I, ha I have a right to say what I'm going to say after Councillor Neitzert said that I'm, I'm saying this for the sake of the 10 o'clock news. If we are not allowed to have any flexibility in what we bring forward, then we are really in a straitjacket here. I was told we can have amendments to a resolution and exactly I wanted the information and I wasn't given the information that I wanted. I wasn't given the information so according to this body of elected officials you get one shot at it and that's it. Then you better shut up and go along. And having backroom conversations and making backroom deals is never going to be a part of how I operate with this group of, of people. I didn't get elected to do that. You don't want me to talk to the media, I'm going to talk to the media. I'm going to tell it straight. And if it's on the 10 o'clock news or if it's, on, if it's never there, I don't care. But I wanted to know about fencing. That's what I was asking about. We were told 
we weren't supposed to have fencing. And I can't, I don't understand why there's so much hostility towards asking for more information. That's all I'm asking for. And that's all I'm asking for. And my gosh, after what we've been through with the event center settlement, the golf course settlement, the golf course, all these different things, the, the parking ramp, not knowing who the investors are, if we think we have a history of openness and transparency in here, it's absolutely not. So I, I, I'm still standing by this resolution. I had a right to bring this forth again. I'm asking for the information. If we get it anyway, that's going to be great. I hope we do. But I think we have a right to know what, what the study said in 2013. And last, last week, Councillor Neisser, you thought this was great to go back and ask him to reveal it. Now we don't, we don't care. We don't care about the history. We're looking back. You got it. Yes, he did. So anyway, um, I just, uh, I, I, I hear it loud and clear. Council Chair. Just a very quick response. I, I believe the councilor is missing our point that we're, we're not questioning your ability to ask for information. Uh, there is a process and a better procedure is what we're trying to suggest versus going to the press first before you even go to the city staff and ask the questions that you could receive and very possibly receive the information that you're requesting without going through this unnecessary resolution which just appears to be done for publicity purposes. Well, you can see it appears to be Excuse done for whatever. Me, I mean, that's I'm, I'm not quite just, just certain that process I'm finished. And please. believe me, I'm very uncomfortable having this discussion in this setting. I'm very much the individual that likes to address issues as they need to be addressed. And if I have concerns, I approach individuals. And I have approached you in the past and others in the past, but unfortunately my efforts have been rebuffed. So it, it, it leads us to this is our only recourse in, in trying to just bring some decorum to this body. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. And, and we encourage you to continue your participation. You have that, you do have that right. And, and I'm, it's me against, it's me against six. Councilor Staley, it's if me you against six. Councilor, Excuse it, me. No, I, but, I, if I can just please see if the other councilors want to speak before you have your third time to speak. That's the way the yes. body, that's the way the body is wanted to do it. I'm just following the protocols that you folks set. Okay. Folks, before I go back to Councilor Staley, is there anybody else who wanted to address uh, this topic? Councilor Staley. And once again, I'm elected to do the, what the, I hear from the public, what is in my heart. I am not elected to be part of the club, the council club. And, and that's, well, and, and since Ky, uh, Councilor Kiley said this is where we're having this decorum discussion, this has been a culture of secrecy, and I'm, I'm hoping we're going to have some change with this next election because it's, it's not serving the citizens well. Did anybody want to make a motion to approve this resolution? Move to approve, Staley. Second, Star. And a motion to approve this item has been seconded. Uh, Councilor Rolfing. I have only one comment to, to make after um, uh, my colleague's statement, and that is that we were elected not to do what a few people, that the only a few people that we can talk to or get emails from. We were elected to make hard decisions on what is best for Sioux Falls. Not what a few people think is best for Sioux Falls, but what we believe in our heart is best for Sioux Falls. And it would be better if we all thought that way. I know most of us do. That's all I got to say. A roll call, please. Council members Neitzert. No. Rolfing. No. Selberg. No. Starr. Yes. Staley. Yes. Erickson. No. Erpenbach. No. Kylie. No. That has failed two to six. Um, Council, is there any uh, other business tonight? Move, Move to adjourn. adjourn or a motion to adjourn uh, has, has been seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. This meeting is adjourned to Falls. Make it a great night.